Nice to meet everyone. Thank you guys for coming today. Um, I'd like to say this week has been a very busy year in the world of generative AI. Um, and my name is Carl Albertson. I lead our generative AI uh, initiatives at AWS SageMaker. Hey, my name is Venkat Viswanathan. I'm a partner solution architect managing Databricks relationship. And today we've got a pretty packed and exciting agenda. So we're going to cover three things. First, we're going to talk about some of the trends we're seeing in generative AI. Um, second, we're going to go into a hallucination and talk about when the, that's a benefit and when that is um, not something you're looking for. And then finally, we're going to go into more detail about retrieval augmented generation, which we're finding is a really interesting technique that many customers are using uh, to reduce hallucination and start drawing facts uh, from the information that are in their data stores. As we go into that, I like to step back and talk a little bit about the pace of innovation that we're seeing in generative AI. And a picture really is worth a thousand words here. So on the left, if we were to go back in time about six years ago, and you took a text to image model and you queried it, or excuse me, you prompted it with uh, create an image of a clean living room, you get something that, that you'd see on the left. We see chairs, lights, it looks like an interior space, maybe a green room, but definitely not clean. Now fast forward to this year, this is a stable diffusion, or stability stable diffusion XL model. You provided the same prompt. You have a beautiful living room. Um, kids' toys are cleaned up. It's definitely tidied up. Night and day picture. And this is really representative of not just what's going on in text to image, but what's going on text to text and other modalities. So let's talk a little bit about you know, what's been leading to this. I'm going to oversimplify it and say that the size of the foundation models has been what's driving that. In reality, it's more complex. Um, but what we've really seen over the last couple of years is as the size of the models have grown, We've been able to move from kind of machine learning, which I like to think of simple inputs, simple outputs, to deep learning, which would be complex inputs to simple outputs, to finally uh, generative AI, which is the, really where you're seeing the point where you can take a complex input and generate a complicated output. And that's the emergent capabilities I think everyone's getting really excited about. But I also like to say that you know, bigger is not always better. And in the real world, what we're finding is most customers are looking at um, how do I find the model that provides the quality I'm looking for? But once they reach that threshold of good enough, um, then quickly they start optimizing for cost, for performance, and other attributes. And that's what we're seeing is leading to a proliferation of models. We're seeing this in the proprietary models, as well as the open source, and a lot of evolution and the development there. We're seeing um, larger models be distilled into smaller, more efficient models. We're seeing models in new modalities coming out, like text to animation, text to video, text to audio, and, and others. Um, and we're seeing domain-specific models for healthcare, financial services, et cetera. And we anticipate that trend is really going to continue. And then, oh, there's a perfect example. Uh, given we're at the Databricks uh, Data and AI Summit, this data, uh, excuse me, Databricks Dolly 2.0 is a great example of taking uh, open source models, then applying uh, instruction tuning. It was about 15,000 question, answer, prompts that led to their open source instruction tune model. And we're seeing that not only with Databricks, but many other developments. So let's now look at um, the first side of when we talk about kind of hallucination. And so a lot of the examples we're seeing are in the creative domain. And this is where you're seeing like text to image, text to audio, text to other different modalities, or even just long form text. I type in a few prompts and I get a poem or an essay or whatnot. Um, this is the case where the hallucination is uh, really what's capturing a lot of the imagination. And I like to say that you know, this is, it's, not a, it's a feature, not a bug. We actually would call this creativity if it wasn't a robot or a machine creating this. But then there's the other side of it, which is what about when hallucination is a bug? And this happens when you're trying to query your own data sets. Um, you're looking to synthesize factual information. Um, how do you do that, especially when the, uh, the model has never seen your data? And so what do I mean by that? So how do I apply, or when would I apply, these generative AI models to, um, to data sets uh, where they actually wouldn't have seen that, uh, the underlying data? So if we think about you know, the top left, we have recent data. So many of these models are trained kind of up through 2022. So they wouldn't know anything about what happened in last week's sporting events or the news. Um, what about when I want to apply the models to my proprietary data sets? Obviously, that data is not part of the, the training data set, so it wouldn't know any facts there. And then what about what do I want to deploy the model? So do I want to deploy it in my, um, my VPC environment? Do I want to deploy it without uh, or with network isolation so it can't access the internet or other updates? Um, and what about citations? So if, if there is something that is generated in the model, 
um, and I want to verify that it is accurate, I want to double click into that, how do I do that? And that's where we're seeing some really compelling solutions come out. And one of it is we're calling retrieval augmented generation. And I like to simplify this by saying what this does in effect is separate the comprehension that a large language model brings from the knowledge base. And so no longer does the model need to know the answer, it just needs to know, to know where to look for the answer, and then it needs to know when it brings that data back, how can it compose it in a way that is then understandable or representative um, by that, uh, by I guess the reader or the audience. And that's really a key thing. This is now kind of a system of models where we're seeing this, this uh, come into play. So with that background, I actually want to hand it off to, to Venki, um, uh, excuse me, to Venkit, and we're going to show a quick demo of how you would do this in the real world. So we go from slideware now to some actual code and scripts and make this real for you guys, and you guys can take this and bring this back to your organizations. So Venki, I'll do the, the swap out. You got that? All right, so that's coming up. And there we go. All right, thank it. Thank you. It is all yours. Okay. Yeah, I need a glass. Okay. So this model um, that I'm going to show is developed by Databricks. So Databricks is building you know, a lot of industry solutions accelerators. So one of the uh, uh, ready-made, you know, you can you can uh, put it on your uh, ecosystem and run it using rag-based approach. Uh, that is what I'm, I'm going to show. And this repo uh, is to start with. This is a biomedical question answering. They say that you have your own data set and you want to do uh, a prompt engineering with question and answering. So how do you do that with LLM model? And you are not doing any hallucinating, you are going to just read from your own document and get the answers from, from this. And this model requires, um, <clears throat> typically you know, for this kind of model, you need uh, uh, data preparation. So data preparation, um, so you get a lot of data, right? Then, the models have got limitations. Like you, know, you cannot just load the entire model, in, and uh, so there is a limitation number of tokens you know, that we say. So we want to minimize the uh, size of the document. Second thing is, when you ask a question, you know you may have a large document. Not all the um, uh, you know the questions are not going to be relevant in the entire document. It's going to be there in partial places, right? So. Uh, chunking is an important um, uh, uh, in a process we do in large language model. That is what we do in the data preparation. So you have this model has got you know PDF documents. It is organized and now you are split, splitting the document into chunks and then you are doing a embeddings and then you store the embeddings embeddings in a vector store. Now once you do that, when uh, you ask a question, along with the question, you are also going to do a similarity check against your uh, chunks and then get only the relevant documents that you want to pass it uh, to the LLM model and then LLM will go through that and do the uh, you know get, provide the right answer to you right that so the first notebook talks about how to organize the documents and how to create embeddings um, so if you look at here, so we are doing a uh, inst inst installation of libraries here, and then um, this is where the data prep. So first you clear out all your documents, you know, uh, start from the beginning, and prepare document DB. So document DB is nothing but here we are using Chroma DB as a, a vector store, and uh, before we run this, you know, we just want to clean this up. But when you do a real life scenario, you don't want to do that. You want to keep appending to your vector store. Right? Uh, and then, um, so it is loading the PDF files and it is going to chunk the files into 120, 128 um, chunk size. So it depends on your LLM models. Right? You know, your LLM model, if it can accept larger tokens, you can even have you know, bigger chunk size. But uh, for this demo purpose, we are using only 128 chunks. So then we, we are going to send only up to four four chunks uh, for any prompt engineering.
So you can see that you know it is created uh, yeah, metadata and the page content, and then uh, so you can see here there is a DB Chroma. DB Chroma is is expecting uh, the document. This is the LHS. Is the first is the indexer. The HLS talks is the indexer, and then you are passing the documents, and then you are calling the embedding model that we are going to use. In this case, we are using a PubMed uh, fine-tuned model for fine, you know, uh, as a model for embedding purpose. And then, where to persist? So it is going to persist in uh, DBFS or underlying S3 um, S3 storage. So once you do that, then the, this one here we are showing that. The Chrome, you know, we are how to load the data from your existing persist store, like a you know, vector, so that it you know, comes in memory, and then you are going to use this uh, vector store for calling, you know, for prop engineering. So the second notebook is about, um, uh, you know, now that you know you are going to call a question, and it is going to bring a similarity document, and then. Uh, and then, like you know, uh, provide the answers with citations, and this is where you got the information. So first is loading the library, and then we are doing. Uh, so again, like you know, we are bringing the data from uh, the vector store it, into memory. So we are using Chroma DB and Retriever. Here we are passing k equal 4, which means this retriever is going to bring the similarity documents or chunks. Only like a top four is going to bring, it's not going to bring more. So this is where, you know, if your LLM model can accept, like say, like, you know, it can, uh, depending on the size, uh, you can even increase the, uh, the chunks. It could be like, you can, you can do the maximum, whatever it wants. Right now, for this model, we are using only four. And then, um, this is a template, you know, a prompting template. If you look at here, we are clearly providing instructions saying that please do, do use only uh, the reference to these paragraphs. If you do not know, say that you do not know, which means it is not going to hallucinate. It is going to get only data, look at the documents and provide answers to you. And for this, we are using the model um, MPT-7B. So you can see that you can see that you know Mosaic ML MPT7B. So as you know, Databricks has acquired Mosaic now. So we are using uh, MPT7B instruct, and this MPT7B also will be part of uh, SageMaker Jumpstart, right? You know, so it is. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that is there, uh, and we are using for fine-tuned model. We are using PubMed. MS Marco for embedding purpose. Now, going back to this, so we create this model uh, using, we are creating this pipeline using this model, and then uh, we build a chain here, then to, to ask questions. So this is how like, we ask questions here. Uh, what is the primary drugs for treating cystic fibrosis, right? So you can see the answer. It is getting, you know, putting, getting the relevant chunk from the PDF, and then, then and, uh, the answer, and then the citation. Okay, like, you know, these three documents have got, or four documents have got, you know, the information relevant to this question. So that's what it does. So um, it's a simple model, you know, it is readily available, it's open source, and you can take it, build it, and you can customize this. You can, uh, instead of using this model, uh, you know, for your own needs, you can put your doc documents, you know, it doesn't have to be PDF, you know, you can use anything. So uh, it's easy to customize, right? So Databricks is like, you know, you can start as, um, um, you can, you can, anything you want to do, a POC or anything, you can start very easily with Databricks. And you can continue to use Databricks even for, you know, as a LLM uh, serving. But when you want to scale it, you know, there are uh, you know, options available with AWS as well, which I would like to uh, call to, um, you know, uh, talk about how to scale uh, with, with AWS and Databricks. Thanks, Venkat. Um, yeah, as Venkat mentioned, I mean, th there's really three main components. Um, so you have your LLM, 
you have your embedding model, and you have your vector database. And those can be different proprietary components, open source components, um, and then you can build on AWS, you can build on Databricks. Um, and we also like to think that you know, on AWS, we provide a lot of tools, whether it be SageMaker or with the underlying database services, to really enable that scale. And so um, many of the models we're optimizing now to be running on our Trainium and Inferentia chips. Um, we also, with SageMaker and SageMaker Jumpstart, are making a lot of these uh, large language models really easy to, to um, deploy and, and, and uh, especially enterprise ready when we're finding a lot of customers want to deploy in uh, areas where there's network isolation. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll close with, we offer um, uh, a number of example notebooks, solution templates, and blogs on the topic matter. Uh, feel free to reach out to either of us directly. We can include you with that. So um, you don't need to go from Slideware to how do we get going. We actually have working solutions that we published um, and would love to invite you to, to build on Databricks, on AWS, and uh, put this into um, both your or your customers' uh, your data sets. So, and then... Um, that's all the time we have. Thanks for attending the session. Please give your feedback. Once again, thanks to Carl and Ed. A round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.